Welcome back to DC Wrap. I'm Pat Pobletti with WISPolitics.com, and my guest this week is former Wisconsin Congressman and current president of the Career Education Colleges and Universities, Steve Gunderson. Congressman, thanks so much for joining me. Well, glad to do it, Pat. So I'd like to have a broader conversation about the challenges facing higher education in this pretty unique moment. But to start, can you kind of explain to our audience who might not be as familiar with your organization who it is that you represent? It's a, it's a great question because, uh, you know, higher education is pretty diverse. Um, and uh, we are a unique segment of higher education. We are those schools that focus on career credentials. We're primarily two year and less. Um, it's not the traditional liberal arts programming. Nothing wrong with that. It's just for a different uh, student who is looking for a different uh, outcome, so to speak. So it's, it's mainly career schools. We have some in Wisconsin, but uh, I'll be honest with you, there's a really big focus in the West, in the Southwest, all the way to the Southeast, um, up probably through Virginia. You have a little bit in the Northeast and in the Midwest, but it's the rest of it that's really heavy. And I, and I think that reflects something in the economy as well. If you have a heavy uh, industrial manufacturing construction economy, you're probably going to have our kind of schools. So we've reported on some of the financial challenges that have been presented to the UW system in terms of a drop in revenue stemming in part from calls for budget cuts from the state in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Are your member institutions facing similar challenges? Sure, sure. This is all of higher education facing this challenge for a number of reasons. Most obvious, student enrollment. I mean, the, the enrollment dropped off significantly uh, in this spring. Uh, and, and understand, uh, Pat, that a lot of our schools do welding, construction, uh, things like that, the HVAC, truck driving, etc. Um, when you move some of those programs online, A, it's not easy. B, because so many of our students are adults, our older students coming back to school. Um, more, many of these students have said to their uh, school campus leaders, they said, I know you're, why you're doing what you are doing, but let's be honest, I'm not made for that. I can't learn welding online. I can't learn HVAC online. So it's just not for me. So they are dropping out. Then obviously in the summer um, with all the uh, pandemic, uh, enrollments have not recovered in many, many of the schools. Um, summer enrollments are lower than they would normally be. We still anticipate that by fall, there will be a significant um, improvement restoration, recovery in those enrollments, uh, but only time will tell. We're not there yet. We've got to wait uh, to see what September and October bring. So as you mentioned, it, it's probably a lot more difficult to learn welding online than perhaps like something like sociology, say. Yeah. So I guess in kind of advising member schools how to open, is, how confident are you that this can be done safely at this point? Well, to, to give you uh, some sense, our schools made that transition from on-site to online in one weekend. Um, none of our, I, I know of one school, a mechanics, a mechanics school in Brooklyn, New York, is the only school I know of that literally suspended all courses. Uh, everybody else has kept their schools operating because it's just what our sector does. They find ways to get it done. Now, I'm not going to tell you that we would win blue ribbons with the best uh, distance learning programming ever, but you know that's also why Congress, when they passed that first CARE Act and they had the higher education emergency relief funds, some of those funds for the first time were grants to our schools, and while the first half had to be used for students, the second half could be used to enhance upgrade your distance education learning because for many of our schools that's been a pretty major investment to buy all the equipment the technology uh the software uh the uh, technicians who can teach you and teach the faculty how to do it and all that kind of thing it's been a pretty expensive investment so i, I do want to come back to congress but let's put a pin in that for just one second because i also wanted to ask about kind of how difficult it's been to advise member schools about how to move forward, given that there's a range of health and hygiene protocols that vary from state to state, and even in some places from county to county within those states. Um, 
we don't get involved in the business of whether a school should be open or not, whether it should be online, on site, or a combination of, of both. We leave that to the school, the local area, the state, uh, whatever it might be. What we do do is we help schools try to figure out how to adapt. For example, almost every school has needed to get what we would call temporary permission from their accreditor uh, to provide distance learning. Uh, we have a real issue uh, with, for example, if a school goes from on-site to exclusive distance education, which most schools have done right now, um, the veterans, under the veterans benefits, the GI benefits, uh, the veteran is scheduled by law to lose uh, about 50% of their benefits if it's an exclusively online program. So we had to work with the VA to get that overridden so that they didn't cut the, the housing, the food, that kind of benefit to the veteran during this process. So we help them with implementing, following the rules, the regulations of the department, of the accreditors, of the vet VA, et cetera. Uh, those are our roles. Now, circling back to Congress, there has been some reporting that there may be some funding for higher ed in the next round of coronavirus relief passed by Congress, if it is passed at this point. What are you hearing on that? And what do you hope to see in terms of that package? Yeah, well, it's a good question. And as of um, the most recent report I've seen is that most of the progress made in negotiations between the administration and uh, the Democrats in the, in the, in the House in particular uh, has focused on non-education issues. Um, sooner or later, they're going to have to get to the education. Um, I mean, both sides have made in their initial proposals significant uh, proposals. I think the uh, Republicans in the Senate did 103 billion, and I want to say the Democrat House did about 96 billion. So there's a lot of money there being proposed. Now that's for all education, pre-K, K-12, post-secondary, etc. And um, where that money goes is yet to be seen. In the first round, it was very clear that the Congress wanted to help students in need. So 50% of all the aid that any school, the University of Wisconsin or Turbo, any school received had to go to student aid. That's not happening in this bill. And it's not happening because I think the traditional higher education community has really led the conversation in the pleas that, hey, we need some help to deal with all of the additional costs, all the additional lost revenue. Um, so schools are pursuing a plea to get money to the institution, not to the students per se. And I think the Congress has heard that call because it's been pretty unanimous from both the publics and the private nonprofits. So um, the only place that I've seen in the two proposals right now where students would benefit is actually in the 1.5 billion that's sort of set aside for schools like mine, family-owned schools, et cetera, where student aid is permissible, not mandated, but it is a permissible use of the funds you receive. Now, to close out here, Congressman, I always give my guests a little bit of time at the end of this spot to kind of talk about anything that might be on their mind, anything they're working on that maybe we haven't touched on in this interview. Wow, um, I, I could uh, filibuster and, and, and take up a long, long time in this. But, but I, think, I think here's the real issue, Pat. You know, we are looking at what, 13% uh, unemployment, 40 million people who have lost jobs. We know with research that two thirds of those who've lost jobs have said that they are probably going to switch careers. And so they're going to need some kind of education. And it is in that kind of an environment that I think the schools that uh, are members of my association, the career schools, have a real opportunity and a real obligation um, to step up and uh, provide that kind of access and the kind of outcomes that will enable these individuals, most of whom are adults, most of whom have families, um, to very quickly uh, move through the academic programs that will give them the credentials they need. Uh, we're all in this together. We need every element of higher education, but our schools play a unique and special role in allied health and in the traditional career areas. And uh, that's going to be pretty important if we're going to have a economic recovery in this country. Congressman Steve Gunderson, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. My privilege. Thanks, Pat.